Well, good morning, church family. Wow, it just feels... I'm going to put this over here because I just... I love the, um, the kids' story, Shenando, and this is going to remind me to keep on track and uh, to remind me of the, the beautiful story you guys shared. It's so um, great to come and share with you guys. It's been such a long time. Uh, such a long time that sometimes when I um, have visited... Some folk have said, they've met me at the, at the foyer and they'll say, oh, thank you, welcome visitor. And uh, it's so good that we have this visitor coming to visit Lakeside Church. We had a, a luncheon, I don't know, s- several months ago, and I was there helping to serve. And this lovely lady sidled up next to me and she was so happy that a visitor was there serving and helping out with the, with the lunch. Her name, I don't want to embarrass her, but uh, her name starts with G and ends with Ian. I'm not sure if you... <laughs> and I thought that was so lovely. And I just hadn't met Jean before, even though I had been coming back and forth you know, to the church a few times. Uh, so it was just nice to be treated like a visitor. Um, Denise and Laurie, where are you? You're going. Oh... The voucher, I understand, I hope it's a big voucher, the, um, the Bunnings one, because you'll need to build an extension. Because I understand you live in Queensland. Oh, fantastic. Make sure everyone has your address so they can visit you in Queensland. Uh, I'd love to visit. Uh, I'll really enjoy that. Um, folk have always asked me, John, are you still a member of the church? I actually got that question this morning. Uh, because they don't see me that often. Yes, I'm still a member here. Um, the problem is, or the problem, the reason why I'm not always here is because I'm traveling, I'm visiting other churches, I'm involved with training, uh, usually through ADRA. Um, so sometimes I go into state, I've been to Tassie and uh, Queensland, Sydney and so on. So for me, it's been a great experience to just to step out of the leadership of the church and just have other experiences and where possible I encourage everyone wherever you can to step out of church as much as you can this is a great place to learn and train and grow as I did and for me it's church has been fantastic but stepping out is also fantastic if you can take that plunge and step out and do something different in conjunction with church all right Let me get into what I wanted to talk about. All right, you've heard the old adage that you can tell or you can determine the character of a person by the friends that they have. You've heard of that before, right? All right, and usually, especially when you're a parent, you are very careful what friends your kids hang around. Okay, I know as a parent, we were always careful with my kids and my mother was always careful who I hung around. Um, let me throw a few things out there. Would you feel, like even now, would you feel comfortable or would you feel happy having a friend who is a constant liar? Would you choose that person as a friend? I mean, sometimes you have a friend and they end up being a liar, right? But you wouldn't go out and choose a friend like that. What about someone who is a cheat? You don't go out and choose friends like that. Who is a cheat? What about someone who is a constant whinger and a complainer? They're exhausting friends. And I know that there are people in, in my life, especially when I talk to my wife, um, there are people who will add to your bubble in your life. You know what I mean by bubble? Your, your energy bubble, your enthusiasm bubble. And then there are people who suck every bit of energy out of you. Right, they're exhausting, and I feel for them, and I have a real heart for them. Would you pick a friend who is uh, vengeful or spiteful? We don't go out to make friends like this, do we? What about a friend who is a murderer? Would you go out and have a friend who is a murderer? Anyone? No, no, I'm just checking. Just making sure where you're at. Okay, no one wants to have friends who are a murderer. Let me change gears a little bit. I'll come back to this. When I was young, 
Uh, I, was, I was born in the 70s. Now, I know you're probably just 70s, wow. But there are people here who were born in the 60s and 50s and even before. I'm not going to ask Uncle Ziggy what era you were born in. <laughs> wow, 35. Before the war. Yeah. Um, in the 70s, it was a really interesting time to be young and to observe my family and, and the church that, that I sort of came, came and went and, you know, back and forth. And one of the things that I uh, experienced, uh, on, especially on Sabbath lunches, is that we'd sit down with the family. The family was there, usually extended family and some visitors, and we'd debate and we'd talk and we'd analyse and we'd dissect. Maybe it was the pastor's sermon, maybe it was something that someone said. I remember one time where we had this, this I remember because I was a little kid, and I remember listening to the adults arguing about this, and they were talking about the beast and 666 and all this, and I don't know if you guys can remember, do you remember when the bank card came in? Who remembers that? Obviously anybody under 40 probably won't. You remember? Yeah? Do you remember the symbol of the bank card? What was the B? What did the B look like? Ah, Ziggy is smiling. He knows. <laughs> what did it look like? Three Bs inside another. Do you remember that? Oh, my goodness. How old am I? <laughs> and I remember that. Church, oh, this has got to be the Bs. This is it. 666. There was three Bs inside it. One, you know, so it looked like six. That was crazy. And then I remember when the um, barcode system came out. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Yeah, some of you are, ah, you know. And there was a symbol and they thought, that's the beast, you know. And I remember just listening to this stuff. The other thing that we, um, we often argued or listened to um, as kids, parents and family arguing, is, is like, do you have to be a vegetarian to be saved? Have you ever had that argument? Don't tell me it's just my family. <laughs> Am I the only one? Okay, we had a strange family. All right. So we had these debates. Do you have to be a vegetarian to be saved? The other one was, I wrote it here, uh, Sabbath. What you can, what you can't do on the Sabbath. Have you ever had that discussion? Oh, there's more people that, okay. You get it. Okay. And the other one I remember uh, talking about f choosing your friends. I remember because I had... Um, when I came to Australia, I spoke Czech. I guess that's my, my background. I'm Czechoslovakian. And I grew up on a street where there was a lot of kids who were Polish. So I learned Polish before I learned English. So when I started school at the age of five or six, I had already learned uh, Polish as my second language, and now I'm learning English. But my friends, uh, parents, didn't know this. So sometimes at the age of, say, seven or eight or so, I would visit my friends, and I could hear what the Polish parents were saying because they thought I couldn't understand. And sometimes they would tell their kids or they tell to each other, watch out for that Smilak kid. He's trouble. Make sure you keep an eye on him. And I often heard that. It was a it's really, I don't know if it was a benefit of having that second language. I don't know. But the point is, I grew up in an environment where there were clear distinctions between one thing and another. The idea that there was people who were on this side and people who were on this side. People who were good, people who were bad. People who were, on the, who were wheat and tares, sheep and goats, righteous and unrighteous, evil and good, saved and lost. We grew up in a very black and white structured framework. We were right, they were wrong. We were saved, they were lost. Can you relate to any of this? I see a lot of people nodding. Okay. So it was a surprise to me when I reached about the age of 19, 19, 20, where I was asking the bigger questions of life, um, as you probably do around that age. I picked up a book, and I may have shared this with you before just briefly, but I picked up a book called The Great Controversy. You've heard of that, obviously. Have you heard of the Conflict of the Ages series? Who has heard of it? Conflict of the Ages. 
No, put your hand up high. I want to know. All right, a few. Anna, you have a lot of work to do here. Conflict of the Ages series, five books. I started reading these five books. What's the first one? Anna, you can't say it because you know. What's the first one in the series? What is it? Are oh, you kidding me? Who knows the five? No, 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 that's not the first one. Patriots and Prophets? Prophets and Kings? Desire of Ages? Acts of the Apostles? Great controversy. There you go. Beautiful set of books. If you haven't read them, read them. But I encourage you to read them in the more modern version. All right? um, they, they clean up some of the language there. Anna, you're going to move a lot of those books here now after this. So I'm, I'm starting to read these, these series of books for whatever reason I was inspired to do so. And what I found is that as I'm reading these books and the history right from the fall uh, at Eden, and it covers the stories of Genesis, Exodus, right through to the end, to Revelation, the New Jerusalem, and everything made new. Those books are fantastic, especially the one on Desire of Ages and the Life of Christ, my favorite. Love those books. What I learned when I was reading those books is that life and people are, is not black and white that life is messy and people are messy. And I started reading about these characters in the Bible and I started to change my opinion on how I felt about others and how I saw myself, in particular how God saw me. I started to, my framework about people and about myself started to shift. Let me ask you this. If you were to... Choose your favorite hero of faith in the Bible. If, you, if there's a hero of faith in the Bible that stands out for you, who is that? Let me just start here and I'll work my way down there. Elijah. Anybody else? John the Baptist. Hero of faith. David. Peter. Samson. Stephen. Anyone else? Joshua, Paul, who? Matthew. So lots of heroes of faith. We have these incredible heroes of faith. What about those who were courageous? Can you think of heroes of courage? Daniel, who? Joseph, yes. Speak, um, so I'm, I'm going deaf. David? Moses? Courage? Yep. Esther. Esther. Yes. I love that one. Heroes of courage. Ruth. Ruth. Yes. One that I think of. Um, it's a strange one, but I remember someone talking about this when I was doing a lesson uh, last year sometime, and it was Queen Vashti. Do you remember Queen Vashti? Do you know why? Hero, courage, because she stood up to Xerxes. That's one hell of a woman. Can you imagine standing up to Xerxes in that culture at that time, what she did? If she's in heaven, I want to look up Queen Vashti and say, wow, what were you thinking? And notice that despite the fact that she technically probably should have been executed for what she did. The king was probably too scared of her and gave her a little palace and said, okay, off you go. Yeah, an interesting woman, that one. I want to get to know Queen Vashti. I was sharing this message or something similar to this message several months ago, and one lady said, Judith. And I thought, Judith? I'm, I'm racing through my memory as, as July, as, um, John and um, Jeremiah, and I went through all the J's and Jude. I didn't know Judith. Do you guys know Judith? Someone must know Judith. Sounds like someone's saying a misspelling of Judas. 
No, it wasn't. It was actually a woman called Judith. Who knows Judith? Yes? Yes. There's a book called Judith. It's in the Apocrypha, which gives you a clue of who this lady was. She was a Catholic visitor at the time, and she was sitting right up the front, and she was so excited because Judith was her hero. I didn't know anything about Judith. I had to look her up and have a look in the Apocrypha. It was fantastic. Um, I can tell you about her, but I won't. But basically, in the story in the Apocrypha, it says that she saved Israel through, through an event that she was involved in. So they're our heroes of faith, they're courage of uh, people with courage, and there's the one thing that we don't often talk about, and that is the dark side of these heroes, the dark side of these friends of God. And I just want to cover a couple of these things. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's important that I frame this so you get where I'm getting, going with this. You know. We often and always, pretty much always, focus on the joys, the praise, the compassion, the love, uh, the strength, the, 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 the heroic acts of these people. But I think we need to also see them as real human beings who are fragile, who are broken, who are, have struggles. Because if we see them like that, I think we can relate to them a lot better. And that may have an impact on the kind of friends that we choose. Give you an example. Uh, Abraham, I can't remember which Genesis 22, I think it is. Abraham gave out his wife to Pharaoh and got money for that. What do you call that? It's like he sold her off for. Do you remember that? Do you remember a movie that sort of covered that theme? Those of us who are older will remember it from the 90s. No, no, no. <laughs> it's a different kind of movie. Um, Indecent Proposal. Do you remember that one? Yeah. When I heard that, when I remember re reading that story, I thought, oh my goodness, this is Indecent Proposal. And I was wondering, would I be friends with someone like that who did that to his wife? Would I be friends with someone like that? Now, of course, you guys are going to tell me, well, it was the culture of the time and it was complicated, and maybe it was. But that's what Abraham did. We think about other dark periods of these people's lives. Jacob, he was a cheat, and he also fought with God. And I don't know if you want to be a friend who's constantly fighting with God and who is a cheat. Remember I asked you before, would you be friends with a cheat, a liar, a murderer? Um, what about Moses? Moses was a murderer. David, what was he? A murderer and an adulterer. Would you make David your friend? Would you? Your next to neighbour is David. And you know what he's done. Would you make him your friend? What about complainers? Uh, Job, Jonah, Jeremiah. All constant complainers. Would you make them your friend? And last uh, quarter, we did the book of Psalms. And that quarter was the one that sort of inspired me to put this whole thing together. And I was making notes. As we're going through Psalms, I'm making notes because I thought, oh my goodness, these psalmists, they had problems. They had dark thoughts. And let me just pick a couple of ones that, that I wrote down here from, from that lesson. They complained about God. They had doubts. They, were par they had paranoia. They were angry. They had hatred in their hearts. They were, there was vengefulness there. There was betrayal there. They expressed angry words towards God. There was misery, suffering, frustration, loneliness, confusion, cursing. And these are things that we don't often realize are part of the character of the authors of Psalms. These were real human beings who had problems. And there was one author, and I'm not going to, I'm going to have to be careful how I uh, say this because there are kids here, but the author had fantasies of 
causing harm to little Babylonian babies. I don't know if you've covered that in the lesson. I'm not sure if it was in there. Did you, did you cover that in the lesson? I'm not sure if you did. So can you imagine having these fantasies? And yet, these were God's friends. They were part of his WhatsApp group, his friends WhatsApp group. What I find is that as I'm reading the different characters in the Bible, which started with that journey of reading the conflict of the ages, 35 years ago, whenever that was, and the more I read and the more I get to know the characters of the Bible, the more I identify not just with their joys and their goodness and their love and their compassion, but I identify with their frustrations and their confusion and their anger. One of the theologians that I follow, uh, he's at Andrews University, he said something interesting about the psalmists. He said, if you look at their theology, he goes, some of the psalmists, you could say, were Calvinists. Another one may have been a Lutheran. You know? We say anyone in the Bible who keeps the Sabbath, what do we say? That they were? What were they? Adventists. Yeah. And when you... Go through the Bible, you can see that every author and every person from beginning to end had a slightly different concept and idea of God and who he was. It's a, it's a mixture, a, a complete, um, what's the word, hodgepodge of, of ideas and beliefs and personalities. It's like humanity is combined in this beautiful book with all its different experiences and emotions and beliefs. For me, that was a very, very rich experience. What does this tell us about the authors of the Bible? Let me just open this up for about a minute or two. What does this tell you about these authors of the Bible? What comes to mind when you think about this? How do you see them? Someone? Somewhat relatable and human. Yeah. Anyone else? Broken? Broken vessels of God. Yeah. Anyone else? Fragile? Unique? And remember, the Bible is written over a long period of time. Different cultures, different places. And the idea of God had changed throughout the history. Of the, if, you, if you look at how God was conceived during the time of Abraham and how God was conceived in Acts, there was a progression, there was a development. And so they also saw, saw God differently. What I find is that when I look at this, I am encouraged because if these are the kind of people that God made his friends, then I ask myself, First of all, why am I not making these people my friends? And that's one thing that I um, experienced when I was going through that, those series, the Great Controversy and the Patriarchs and Prophets, so the Conflict of the Ages series. As I was reading that and I saw how God was compassionate and caring and to the women and to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles and to the lepers and to the homeless and to the orphans and to the widows, I thought, what is wrong with me? Why don't I have a heart for these people? You know, I was in my early 20s, so maybe you can say, well, at early 20s, you don't know anything. Well, I'm, what am I, 58, and I still don't know anything. But back then, I really struggled. And I would go into the city, I was about 21, 22 years old, I'd be walking through the city, and there'd be a homeless person there, and I had no heart for this person. And I'd go back on the train, and now I'm reading Desire of Ages. And I'm reading about how God had heart for them. And the next day, I'm back in the city because I was working in the city. And another homeless. I'm thinking, why don't I have a heart for these people? What is, what is wrong with me? And then back on the train, I'm reading again, next chapter. And I found this tension. And I thought, what is wrong? Why don't I have a heart for these people like Jesus does? And I started praying. I said, Lord, can you give me a heart like that? Can you soften it? Can you mold it? Can I see these people through your eyes? 
Because at the moment, I don't. I don't get it. And God took me on a multi-decade journey. I wish he could do it like that. But with me, my heart was so hard, was so cold, was like a stone when it came to these people, that I, it took a long time for me to get it. Oh, I got it in church. I had friends at church and I loved and I was an elder and I was involved in church leadership and Pathfinder director and I had my friends at church. But I could not relate to the friends outside of church, especially those on the margins of society. God had to take me on a journey. Now, you may not relate. Maybe you're in a different place to I was, but I needed to go through this journey. What I found is that as more I opened this book, the more I realized this was God's spiritual diary of his friends. That he asked his friends to contribute and put in the letters and the chapters and the books that they experienced, both the good and the bad. They were authentic, they were genuine, they spoke from their heart. Something even we struggle to do, even in a safe place like this in church, we struggle with that. What I also found is that God cares more about his friendship with these folk and with us than our behaviour, than what we do, than our acts. And that is evident by the friends <laughs> that he had in the Bible. Some of their acts, some of the things they did was horrible. We won't be their friends, but God, he was their friend. Who has the problem? If we don't want to be their friends, but God is, who has to grow? Who needs to adapt? Who needs to change? Who needs to find a different perspective? Maybe it's God. I love the fact that God understands that we are all flawed. We all need to learn and we all need to grow. And he's incredibly patient with us. Shall I share this part with you? I will. All right. When I was young, like I said before, I was in my early 20s, I was a young elder. I was part of a, an eldership group. I was the youngest one there. Most of the people there were in their 50s and 60s. And unfortunately, when you're in leadership, and anyone here who's been in leadership, you see the good things, you see the powerful things of leadership, but what do you also see? You see the dark side of leadership, don't you? Yeah. And those of you who know what I'm talking about, we're nodding your heads, you know. And as a young man, sometimes we need to be careful when we encourage young people to get involved in this kind of leadership. Some young people are ready for it. They're mature enough and they can go and they can handle the conflict and the tensions because all leadership has that. And I experienced this and I saw the darker side of leadership. Um, and this had an impact on me because I picked up some of the things that I saw there, good and bad. Right? It's not wasn't all bad. It's some good things too. And I remember um, how much I have changed over the last 35 or so years because there's a church, a couple of churches that keep inviting me back to speak, and I was running out of sermons. And I thought, oh my goodness, I need to. I don't have time to create a new sermon. I will go to a sermon that I preached when I was in my 20s. And so I go onto my computer and I saw some notes there and I thought, I can't even remember the title of this thing. My goodness, it was like 30, 40 years ago. And I had a look at the sermon and I was reading it and I thought, this is not my sermon. I don't recognise this person. Did I preach this? I was embarrassed. <laughs> I was embarrassed at how I thought back then. And at that point, I thank God for the journey that he had taken me on. Wow. Wow. I wish you guys have had that same experience. If you could go back to your teens, some of those of you who are my age or older, and if you could see how you thought and what you said and what you did in Sabbath school class or whatever, it's an amazing experience. But because I had this written down, I, I couldn't preach it. There was no way. I was completely embarrassed by that. Um, and of course, I became very, very judgmental. Uh, of different groups, and this is why I had problems with people like the homeless and the, those on the margins of society. Because you see yourself 
when you're in this kind of environment, that because you are right, because you are the church, because you have the truth, because you know what we know, and because we have this package, then we are here and everybody else is down there. And they need to come up to our level. But when I was reading the Conflict of the Ages series and Desire of Ages and the life of Jesus, I noticed that, hang on, Jesus did the very opposite. He came from up there and he came down to there. And he connected with the vulnerable. He connected with the lepers. He connected with the widows. I needed to change. Even if I had murdered 200 innocent people, I knew that there was hope for me. Do you know who murdered 200 innocent people? Do you remember who that was? Yeah? And David. We don't know how many Paul killed, but David, he killed 200 innocent people and God did not reject him. So I realized that I was not driven away by the things I did, but God was drawing me in because of who I was. I was his son. And for some of us who have been brought up in this structured law, we are, have this and they have that, and it's the sheep and goats and wheat and tares and saved and lost. We sometimes struggle with that if we have come from that culture. And this one here, this, this text from Matthew 23, is a great one. You know the one, um, uh, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees? What's the next word? Hypocrites. What do they do? They tithe what? Mint and cumin, and they, they tithe all the tiny little seeds, but they neglected what? The weightier, the meatier, the substance, the, the chunkier part of the law. What was it? What was it? What, what was it that they, that they were neglecting? What was the chunkier part of the law? Charity. What was it? Justice, mercy, faithfulness. And in Luke, he adds, and the love of God. They had all these beautiful structures. They had all these wonderful things. They had the law, but they forgot the, the weightier, the meatier, the chunkier part of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness, and the love of God. Hmm. And you mentioned Paul, and I thought, if God can love the kind of people he did in here, then, and, oh, and what a complex group of people there are in here, that he could even love someone like Paul, whom to the Christians was a terrorist. Wasn't he? Yeah. Saul, before he became Paul, he was a terrorist. So can I throw that out there, that maybe God even befriends terrorists. And I know that's a tough one because of the environment that we are in at the moment with the wars. But can you think of anybody else who had terrorist ideas in the Bible? Yeah, I'm thinking mostly of those people who are Christian or who are believers. I'll tell you a story. Do you remember one, um, the, um, when the disciples were going through a Samaritan town and the Samaritans I think rejected them from memory and James and John said Lord shall we call down the missiles from heaven and order a drone strike and destroy this village do you remember that one yeah it's a very terrorist way of thinking these people have offended us I think we need to nuke them you know send some missiles their way now imagine Imagine what Christianity would have been like if Jesus said, eh, you know what, you're right. In this case, we, we should destroy them. Can you imagine what the history of the Christian church would have been like? <laughs> would have been a different faith. What did Jesus show? He showed the meatier, heartier, the chunkier part of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness, the love of God. Another group um, I think of is uh -huh, the Assyrians, you know, city Nineveh. Jonah was sent to save what would be the closest thing we have to Nineveh today, ISIS. 
They were horrible. You, you look up any commentary on Nineveh, any commentary on the Assyrians, what they did and how they treated people was horrible. The closest thing I would say would be ISIS, and yet God loved them. That's a tough one. It seems that God has a huge heart for his sons and daughters, no matter where they are. And that puts us in a very difficult position because they're meant to be our brothers and sisters. And how do we love these people? I know it's a complex journey. And I'll get to we'll discuss it in a minute as to how we navigate this. But there's one more story I want to share with you, one more example uh, from my experience. Um, I think it was maybe six months, four months ago, I was at one of the ADRA programs that I'm involved in, and I met a man, older man, leathery skin, tattoos, dressed uh, a bit shabbily, had some gold chains and things, missing teeth. I think he had maybe three or four teeth. He was there sitting alone, and I thought, well, I'll connect with this, this broken man whose history of life was written on his you know, on his exterior. You could, you could read his life just by looking at him. And I thought, I'm going to connect with him, sit with him. Maybe he'll open up, maybe he won't, we'll chat. And we did. We chatted, he was very friendly, very open. And the more we chatted, the more I began to like him and respect him. He was kind, he was gentle, he was sensitive, he was open, he was authentic, he shared his life with me. And I thought, wow, this exterior that I saw does not match the interior that I'm experiencing. And as I'm chatting with him and, and really enriching my experience with this, and I, I'm, I'm thinking, it's, it's like I saw the Spirit of God in his life. And as I'm chatting with him, two of his kids run. And they put their arm around him, and you know, one's about nine, and one's about seven, and they love their dad. And I thought, okay, they feel safe with him. You know, he's not an abuser. He's obviously very loving and very caring. I thought he was 70 years old. I asked him how old he was because his kids were very young. He was 37 years old. He had the kind of life that I can't even imagine. Drugs and in and out of prison and all sorts of things. But you know what I saw in him? I saw the fingerprint of God in his heart. I saw that there was something beautiful in him. And he may not know the name of Jesus, he might not know his character, but if he dies and he passes away, he will recognize his voice because his life has expressed the, the goodness, the compassion, the love already in his life. Can you relate to that? Have I lost you? No, okay. So that for me, I, I walked away from that experience enriched. I'm the one who was blessed, not him. The blessing was here. Remember the story of Peter when he was up in the, oh, what was that city? We had the dream of the um, meat lover's pizza. Do you remember that dream? Where was that? I can't remember the city. Yes? Yes. I think his name was Simon, his friend's place. Anyway, so he has this picture of uh, you know, the, the dream of the meat lover's pizza. And by the way, this meat lover's pizza, it had everything in it. It had scorpions, it had cockroaches, it had rats. It was the unclean meat lover's pizza. You don't want this pizza, all right? And neither did Peter. Anyway, I'm going to fast forward the story because you know the story. So Peter ends up at Cornelius' house. And Cornelius was a Gentile Roman soldier, the enemy of the people. And Peter goes in there and he starts giving him the 28 fundamentals. And he's only through the first one. I think he's halfway through the first Bible study, fundamental number one. And what happens? He doesn't even finish it. And what happens? The Holy Spirit falls on the whole household on the Gentile soldier, on his wife, on the kids, on the servants, everyone. What a beautiful story. When Peter left, who, who had the biggest blessing from that experience? Who had the biggest change in their life from that experience? I will tell you it was Peter. 
Peter is the one. And the, the, the impact was so great that he got a call from Jerusalem from James because James heard about this. And Peter picked up his mobile and James says, what, what is going on? And then Peter had to go to Jerusalem and explain what was going on. It was such a big deal. He changed Peter. He changed the church. What did Peter do? He stepped out of his comfort zone. He connected with people, with friends that were friends of Jesus, but were not friends of Peter. Peter had this barrier, and that barrier needed to be crossed. And sometimes we need to have that barrier crossed in our life. Sometimes it needs to happen within the church. And here's the question I want to ask you before. How do we safely navigate this? Because in the beginning I said we want to protect our children. We want to make sure they choose good friends. But at the same time, we want to be the salt of the earth. Yeah? Amen? How do we navigate this, this, this part of being protective and to the part that we want to be the salt of the earth and to make these people our friends? How do we do that? Just a few thoughts. Anyone have any, any wisdom here? Pray? Yeah. The Holy Spirit's got to work. Yeah. Yeah. Be there, support them, don't be too preachy. How do we protect our children, but at the same time we want them to grow and mature? And I think a good place to do that is in the church. Why? Because if we can learn to love here, if we can learn to accept one another here, if we can learn to deal with the tensions, and there are tensions, every church has, has their tensions, no church is perfect. If we can learn to love here in a safe environment, then we can learn to love out there where it's colder, harder, and the challenges are much greater. And like that's, I really believe that church is a great place to grow, especially for young people. Young people, get involved in the church. Be involved in anything. Put your hand up and say, why wasn't I nominated for this? Go to your leadership and say, hey, listen, we had the nominating committee, and I noticed, and uh, where's that fellow who did the, the reading today? What's his name? Archer? Uh, What's your name? Yeah, you can call that out. Archer, is it? Future preacher there. You need to go to the nominating committee and say, Pastor, why am I not on the preaching roster? You tell them. You tell Pastor Ryan. You say, you've heard me uh, read the, um, um, the mem- uh, what do you call it, the, um, the scripture reading. <sighs> Look what a good job I did. I mean, you couldn't see me behind the pulpit, <laughs> but you could hear me. Archer, you need to tell them. Get involved. Those of you who are older, give the keys to the church to the young people. Train them. Encourage them. Get them involved. Why? Because they will build experience. They will build character. And then they'll be able to step out and deal with these unique, broken, unusual people in the world that God loves. And hopefully through this experience... We will all learn to love them as Jesus does, and we will see them as he does, and it will change our, our lives. In the end, we are the ones who will be ultimately blessed from that experience. There's only so much we can do here. There's only so much that we can do in this community. But when we look at the brokenness and the complexity and the different belief systems and the a variety of people in here, And God loves them and calls them his friends. I pray for our church and our community that we will begin to see the same kind of people, the lepers, the widows, the broken, the enemies, the Romans, the Gentiles, the homeless, the drug addicts, the neighbors, the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Buddhists. My Buddhist friend over there, love her dearly, that we will see them the same way that Jesus does, and through his eyes. That's my prayer for our our family here at Lakeside. Amen.